Welcome. This is um, another episode of the conversations on peaceful change that the Global Research Network on Peaceful Change has initiated. And today we have actually uh, one of uh, Grand Peck's uh, regional coordinators, uh, Professor Deborah Larson. Professor Deborah Larson is one of the, definitely one of the most significant scholars in the United States and the world on the subject of status today, uh, her works have uh, pioneered a lot of uh, interest in that subject area. Uh, a lot of young scholars have uh, started uh, looking at different dimensions of status. And um, uh, Professor Larson and her uh, collaborator, Alex uh, Ko recently published a book from Yale University Press called The Quest for Status. China and Russia uh, for a um, uh, China's and Russia's uh, efforts for status, and um, we are going to have a short conversation on the book. And since the book was published last year, there are significant uh, additional information, as well as uh, considerable changes in the policies of Russia and China. And so, Professor Larson, welcome and. Um, uh, she's a distinguished professor at UCLA and a good friend of ours and uh, my, me personally. And it's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you. So let me start by asking you, uh, first uh, suggesting that the book is very impressive. I actually, uh, reading it second time, I have only conclusions left. And I must say that uh, why is it uh, significant is you go back to some 500 years of Chinese and Russian history to show this is a pattern that status has been one of the core uh, behavioral traits, status quest of these two large entities. And it's ongoing. It doesn't look like the quest is uh, going to be uh, <laughs> over anytime soon. And so the core question then is, what is this problem of status and uh, wh what is the core argument you are making based on your historical plus contemporary analysis in the book? Well, the, uh, the argument is derived from social psychology, which is that social groups or states strive for a positively distinctive identity. In other words, they want to be not only different, from other states but better and Russia and China have sought to be great powers for at least 500 years of their history it's part of their identity and according to social identity people identify with their state they bask in its triumphs you know like Nobel prizes and Olympic medals and they are depressed by its defeat or humiliation Yes. So that is the interesting thing. Um, but it matters to many other states, but there's a historical process here. Is it a socially learned trait or is it how do they become like this? Not all entities have the same quest, uh, small states, small entities. But it seems in this case, there's emulation going on. There is effort to imitate the West or not to be the West. And the whole notion of power and status seem to be interconnected in these two cases. Uh, and so how do we distinguish status from power, from uh, material quest, uh, as well as uh, security and all these other concepts that international relations scholars in particular seem to pay a lot of attention to? Well, status is a part of one's identity, and China and Russia's identity as great powers hasn't been directly correlated with their relative power. I mean, both China and Russia have always seen themselves as great powers, even when they were weak. Mm -hmm. You know, like even in the 1990s when Russia was weak, it still saw itself as a great power. I mean, Putin said Russia has been and will always be a great power. And one of the things that we note in our book is that Ivan the Terrible, um, you know, saw 
himself as, you know, he thought that he should be regarded as equal to the Western countries. And so he demanded to be recognized as czar in the Western countries. said, well, who are you? <laughs> Why should we recognize you? So, you know, it, it seems to be part of their identity. Maybe it's partly Russian orthodoxy. There was the fact that China had no pure competitors. Yes. It was the Middle Kingdom. It was isolated. So, you know, it took for granted that it was a great power. Yeah. And so this identity was forming and you see different markers during Peter the Great. You talk about his attempts to become like a Western state. Catherine the Great uh, then pushes the expansionist agenda. So it seems like uh, different rulers come up with uh, different ideas. Um, and sometimes they're not necessarily consistent with the markers or accepted markers of the times. Uh, and it is very clear that uh, today we see the behavior of Russia and China, at least in the West, there is a tendency to look at them as uh, um, why do they, uh, why are they behaving the way they are behaving? You know, so because people don't use this prism of status and, and they may be using a different marker or traditional marker of spheres of influence, for instance. Whereas the Western countries already established their spheres of influence, don't think that should be the prime concern. Is it, is it something that you find it, the current dis, a disconnect between uh, the status quest of these states and say the United States, for instance? I think that's a really good point. TV. Um, to some extent, their view of status is anachronistic. Uh, the United States talks about a liberal world order and rule governance system, and, and both China and Russia are thinking in terms of spheres of influence. And the United States has a sphere of influence in Latin America, but we don't admit it. Mm. And, and the United States has historically been opposed to spheres of influence, and we say that Russia is not entitled to have um, influence over the near abroad. Mm. And th this is a major source of dispute. I mean, the Russians see us as um, hypocrites. Yes. And, and, the, Chi and the Chinese, uh, you know, think that they have the right to dominate Southeast Asian nations. A historically, driven, a historically driven right, they think. They do, right. But the problem is the other states especially in the era of nationalism, sovereignty, sovereign equality, don't accept that. I mean, earlier times, the Chinese had the tributary system and they could easily get their way. But today, even the Chinese state uh, will stand up at least as much as they can because they need to defend this, uh, their precious skip called sovereign existence. No? And so there is that problem of uh, dissonance there as well. So the other question is, what is the relationship between material power and status? For instance, you can see when a country's uh, material power increases, its status ambitions also change. China under Deng's period, you know, materially weak, uh, acquired all these uh, trade privileges. And then now today, China is stronger, so you see the Chinese ambitions, you know, and the strategy also seem to have changed because uh, it's no longer the so-called uh, peaceful rise, uh, peaceful rise too, they call it, but clearly it's not that peaceful. So <laughs> what explains this relationship? Once you have the certain material power, you expect more status. Is that, is that the connection? Or? I think that material power influences how states seek status and also to some extent affects their aspirations as you point out you know a weak state like malaysia is not going to aspire to great power status but you know former former great powers or former mm -hmm. empires you know like britain and france and india and so forth their aspirations are not entirely connected with their material power but how they seek status depends on their material power. You know, like under Deng Xiaoping, um, China sought status by being a responsible, well, be, be, by being a responsible power, by economic growth, um, you know, through peaceful rise. And once it became more powerful, now it 
it's engaged in bullying. And I think it's also a question of relative power, their power relative to the United States. Right now, they think the U.S. is declining and they can supplant the United States. That could be a misleading too, no? Because um, a declining power can, if it is declining, can try to arrest them. That's the whole thesis of uh, Alison, uh, Graham Alison, supposedly these trap. The idea that declining power don't just go away like that. Because right. And the United States isn't really declining. We have a current governance problem, a problem with a weak federal government, but we still have the resources and hopefully um, that will change. Yeah. In the case of Russia, Russia isn't powerful enough to be a constructive member and so it engages in spoiling. Mm -hmm. You know, humiliating the United States, you know, as in um, Afghanistan and the interference in our elections. I mean, it's, you know, just blocking things in the UN. But they, so, would, so argue, they would argue that it is uh, uh, tit for tat that the US and Western countries did not follow through the promises made to Gorbachev and therefore they are doing whatever they were denied. This is the status denial. Uh, or legitimate uh, complaints sometimes leaders of these countries make that they never lost the Cold War. The West simply uh, assumed that uh, Moscow lost it and then treating them as a subaltern or second class great power, sometimes, yes, sometimes uh, very contemptuously. So they have, a, they have a psychological thing going on here, which is essentially compensating for what you did to us, I'm going to do that to you, kind of thing. Isn't it's that a grievance, yeah, retaliation. Yes. They have a real sense of retaliation and grievance, which isn't entirely rational. Hmm. Yeah, but because it doesn't help you advancing your cause beyond the point, I guess. And although some They're like the bounties, pay, you know, if, the, if it's true, hmm. you're paying, paying bounties for US soldiers. That, that doesn't seem to me to be rational. Yeah, but others say that it is for domestic political reasons. Status um, um, behavior like this, we may think as irrational or exuberance, helps a lot. But look at Putin, he's winning all these elections. Some, some of them, we don't know <laughs> the exact situation. But clearly, uh, for Xi Jinping too, this domestic uh, Assertion, assertion internationally helps domestically. And I know in India, Mr. Modi is trying that, but with severe constraints. And so international status, whether achieved or ascribed or uh, attempted, help domestic power position of the elite concern. What do you think of that relationship? I mean, that is a very difficult one to break if you, your power is tenuous. You have to really work on it through other means, externalization, for instance. Well, it wouldn't work as a domestic strategy if people didn't care hmm. about their state's relative status. Yes. Yeah, so I, I would like you to hear a little bit more because I, you know, if you look at the way some of the Russians, for instance, you ordinary Russians in the street, if you ask, they become very defensive of Russia and they, they don't want to be treated as second-class citizens, even though their material capacity may be limited at this point, economic capacity. Right, they think the West, there's a double standard, uh, and they speak a lot about um, humiliation, and they've never forgiven President Obama for referring to them as a regional power. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this just rankles. Yes. So I think they were, they sort of delighted in the uh, Crimean, annexation because it was a way of striking back you know Russia could say no yeah right but th there's a limit to that because at a certain point status aspirations run into conflict with material goods and if the if if Russians Russia's economy is stagnating which it is and going down then these nationalist appeals don't work quite as well yeah and also you gain something but then you lose in big way now uh, economic relationships, friendships that you established, or your uh, good neighbor relations with countries that you want to appeal to. So there are these trade-offs that they don't necessarily seem to consider 
or they consider and they decide that it is worth taking the risk as Xi Jinping is doing with India today or in South China Sea. A lot of people question that strategy because why do you want to lose all these countries? Potentially, they could be your uh, partners, economic partners, or at least you want to neutralize them. Instead, he's going after everybody, he's trying to gain a little advantage on the territorial market. So, which which questions and what, what exactly is going on in the minds of leaders of this, this type of behavior when they practice this type of behavior? Oh, you mean Xi Jinping's uh, militants going after everybody, yeah, make, right you know, an enemy with everybody? Well, they, uh, they say it's uh, wolf warrior diplomacy yeah. that um, all of a sudden China is saying, well, you know, we're powerful, so we're going to... Um, we're going to show everybody, and and the Chinese do sort of have that traditional sense of arrogance, you know, going back to the 19th century when they refused to um, admit Western diplomats to their country. You had to kowtow. <laughs> so th there's this traditional arrogance. I think they're trying they're trying to bully India into moving away from the U.S. The wedge strategy. They sort of creating a wedge between. U.S. and India, but it's opposite is happening now. They are invited. I think there's going to be a backlash. Mm. There is a backlash right now. A lot of European countries are offended by um, Chinese rhetoric. You know, Australia's fighting back. Canada. Yep. So, but but the leaders. So I think in, it will backfire. Yeah, but in the closed systems, they don't necessarily realize that because they may not be getting counter arguments no the bureaucrats cannot... right that's the problem with the authoritarian system it's kind of like um well in our system where <laughs> trump fires everybody <laughs> he won't listen to dr fauci you know and so there's kind of a parallel with xi jinping i mean he didn't respond to the virus i think probably because he wasn't getting um the people were probably afraid to tell him the extent yeah but in history, to their credit, I mean, they have Deng, who says, bide your time, you know, don't stand up if you, you sit first before you can stand up. You know, a lot of these interesting um, anecdotal kind of things he says, which are really fascinating, advising very sagely that you shouldn't fight if you don't have the material capability, I don't even fight. Uh, and Sun Tzu is also, you know, it's, it seems like a contradiction sometimes they can be very cautious and prudent i'm talking about the chinese uh, strategic behavior but other times like mao's times you, you discuss in the book a lot of things that did are really difficult to fathom including the cultural revolution or the great leap forward or behavior vis-a-vis -vis russia etc but, but at the same time um, there is a tradition of prudence in the chinese state craft isn't it and uh, more recently, I think the uh, Wang Yi delivered a speech where he said that there was no reason for the U.S. and China to be enemies and that uh, China doesn't want to supplant the U.S. So they may have realized, at least some members of the leadership hmm. may have realized that they went too far. Yeah, but they may have uh, PLA or other stakeholders with the, their own agenda. Sometimes the local commanders could do certain things differently. So that's, I, I want to talk about uh, accommodating rising powers. You may recall I have an edited book as well as you also discuss a little bit in your book and we had uh, another edited volume, co-edited volume that we did. We had a topic of accommodation. Is status accommodation possible? What are the mechanisms? I mean, we talk about institutional accommodation. Is that sufficient or uh, is that only up to a point? Like country is not there yet, maybe some institution. But once you accommodate a country through institutional mechanisms, if it is not getting other things as China is showing now, it was accommodated in many institutions. Um, is it the question is, what is institutional accommodation? I mean, it has, it's more than just membership. Hmm. Uh, I think China was unhappy because it didn't have a sufficient quota in the IMF. Mm. And right now, China thinks that it should be able to shape some of the norms of 
the U United Nations, you know, that it should have some say as a great power in, in the norms of the international organization. So that's something. And, and the membership in institutions can't be just cosmetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the things that Russia thought after the end of the Cold War. Yes, there was something, the Russian NATO, NATO Council, but Russia had no say in it. I mean, you had no power. Yes, that's very interesting. I mean, that's why the UN Security Council, the notion of veto for the P5 makes a difference, but at the same time, the Security Council is no longer very effective on most matters of international security. So that creates, so they don't have many avenues for decision making or influencing but they say that the chinese uh, have now taken over uh, many of the subsidiary uh, organizations of the un uh, including now accused to be controlling the who which i don't think is exactly the case but the point is they are successful and they have been uh, using other institutional forums some they created so institutions matter and the question is at to what extent and then whether institutions are um, institutions need to adapt to and institutions sometimes can get stuck and stagnate as we notice with the UN. No? Well it, it also seems right that right now the United States and, and Russia and China are sort of ignoring especially the United States are acting outside of institutions. Mm -hmm. You know China's creating its own institutions like the Belt and Road Initiative yeah. And the AAIB and the United States, you know, is engaging in bilateral bilateral trade negotiations with China, excluding the WTO. Um, there's no longer any sort of arms control negotiations with Russia. So it seems that right now the United States is just completely ignoring institutions, and they lose a lot of their um, so, status, mm -hmm. right? Their ability to accommodate if they're not used. Yes. I don't think the Trump people or administration thinks on those lines. What the power, what kind of power the U.S. holds in this institutional power? Once you lose it, cre cre creating will be very hard. And uh, it's uh, one of the liberal arguments so institutions provide power as well as uh, opportunity to solve collective action problems. But the, but the question is, um, institutions sometimes need some push like that, isn't it? I mean, institutions get stagnated. That's what I'm arriving at. And, and, and that can come only when these outside power states or others push hard and then an effort to adapt to the changing circumstances. Um, I, I, think, I think it's very, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, up to what point a rising power can be accommodated through institutional means or is it is it more than that? And you, you alluded to this need for responsible decision, stakeholder position. Right. Mm. To be a responsible stakeholder, to influence deliberations. And it doesn't have to be formal international organizations. It can be informal groups. Yes. And there is a problem with international institutions being sticky, as mm. they say. And once they're set up, it's really difficult to modify them. So maybe one way to get around that is to have these more informal groups, you know, like the group of states that dealt with Iran, you know, the Iran nuclear agreement, yes. um, you know, on North Korea, the group of six, um, some of these smaller organ smaller groups yes. can be able to set up process. for particular issues. Yeah. But the challenge is the United States, as you say, is also a revisionist power when it comes to these institutions. It goes for institutional mechanisms, then it abandons, which is what uh, people, you know, the, the notion of credible commitment is overused in IR theory, but when you apply that to the US, it looks like uh, we have a problem there, isn't it? <laughs> it does, because um, the United States talks about being um, a multilateral power, but then whenever the UN doesn't agree with what it wants to do, it goes outside the UN. Yes. And we're going outside the WTO. Yeah. So that's a challenge for US policymakers to have a consensus on the role of institutions for sort of the peaceful change that we are uh, looking at. Because are we in that 1930s mode right now? We had the pandemics in the early 20s, end of the 
1918 to 20, and then you have a period of intense crises, and Germany rose, and then it created all that challenge to the order. So that status problem of Germany and Japan of 1930s seems to be different today, but obviously there's some connections there. Right. I think maybe one difference is that nuclear weapons, China wants to be the hegemon of the Asia Pacific, but it wants to do it without going to war. Right. Two different strategies. Right. And economic interdependence, China's dependent on trade, um, you know, with the United States. Yeah. You wrote about uh, some time back about the Cold War wasn't all that inevitable, the first Cold War. Right. A lot of misperceptions. Now, bringing back to that notion today, is this new Cold War, second Cold War, or third Cold War, you want to call it, is that inevitable, or is that something agents can change if they change their policies? What, what do you think of, what's the role of status in that context? Is, is this coming Cold War inevitable? Oh, we can definitely avoid a Cold War. Um, as I said, one, there's a couple of differences. One, we can't fight a war with either China or Russia. Mm. You know, it, it would just be, you know, because of advanced weapons, because of nuclear weapons, it would be too risky. So we can't do that. And we can't, and, and we have, we're economically interdependent with China and it would be impossible to decouple our economies without huge costs, mm. huge economic costs. And Germany, I'm not even sure Japan thought, it would be Germany and then. Britain thought the same way too. No? Also, we don't have the ideological rivalry that we had in the Cold War, yeah. because China really does not have an attractive model. No, not, not the way communism was. It's efficient in delivering certain things, infrastructure, for instance. So that appeals to some, but it doesn't have anything else, at least at this point. Um, so and I think most states, most countries wouldn't accept the amount of repression hmm. that the Chinese, you know, they, they, they just wouldn't accept that degree of authoritarian repression. Yes. Um, but then we know from history that some leaders can push their luck. I mean, the Kaiser, for instance, Wilhelm II, or uh, all those uh, historical figures that you address in both China and Russia. At some point, they thought they can push hard and gain more territory, more uh, status. So this is not completely impossible if you have a very clever strategy to think of acquiring more uh, spheres of influence, territory, etc. And my final question is this notion of status markers. Who determines the status marker changes. I mean, we, we, uh, markers change, but it seems like uh, uh, today the Western world or the liberal world uh, sort of assumes that these are the accepted status markers. Democracy, freedom, all these good things need to be done before you claim anything big. But um, that that is, isn't that also a, a, a conflicted idea because uh, for the Russians and the Chinese, this marker that the Western countries ascribe need not be very useful. I think so. I think now, I think the, democ the idea that democracy is necessary for great power status has been invalidated by China. Hmm. I mean, pe people respect China. They, um, they regard it as a great power, as a superpower, and China is not democratic. I think now the leading status marker is technology. Mm. And that's why China has that made in China 2025. They want to be the leader in the 10 technologies of the future. And I think that's why the United States is so anxious mm. about Huawei. The United States does not want the Chinese to be superior to us in 5G, but they already are. Yeah. So this is very damaging to our self-esteem. Yeah. So e even the nuclear arms race is no longer about numbers of nuclear weapons. It's about hypersonic glide vehicles and cruise missiles and you know technology. Yeah. AI, n a nuclear torpedo. Some of them have uh, civilian applications too. So it's not like they want to show who is most productive, who is most efficient. 
uh, 5G will make things a lot more, apparently a lot more efficient for handling data and things like that. So the, the question is, where are we going in the 21st century? Are we going to see more status conflict uh, or we are going to see some level of accommodation because there are constraints on status seekers up to a point they can push, but they have to contend with certain amount of constrained status. There, there could be some uh, soft balancing yeah. <laughs> against, <laughs> against China's and Russia's efforts to seek status and also against Trump's uh, unilateralism and, and um, his assertiveness. I think, you know, Trump has also been assertive, demanding, you know, demanding that countries adopt, you know, change their trade practices, you know, and, and buy more American goods. I think it all, a lot of it will depend on who is elected president. Yes. The U.S. cycle. If Trump is reelected, then we're going to have more great power competition. Mm. More. Because they say that even Biden will have, I mean, you look at the U.S. presidents, you know, the biggest warriors were Democrats, Democratic presidents. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> it's not clear whether Republicans are the fighters sometimes. So. I think in terms of status competition, um, mm -hmm. Biden would be more likely to join with European allies. So Use that the competition become more global in that sense. India may more join. institutional accommodation. Yeah, yeah. So it's fascinating subject. And uh, what else needs to be done? That's sort of my final question. Now that you've done this work, what would you advise? What are the topics that really need to be done? Because it seems there's a lot more can be done with status. You mean where we need research? Yeah, research and, and also policy. Well, I think you identified a really good topic, um, institutional accommodation. It's, mm -hmm. it's more than just membership. There has to be um, some sort of, as you say, responsible, or as I say, responsible stakeholdership. Also, um, the determinants of status markers, yes. as you pointed out, like w what determines um, what, what communities value in a particular historical era. And there could be some comparative historical studies to see when and why status markers change. Yes. And um, also status and conflict uh, at different levels, whether it, has, uh, uh, it is a big cause of conflict or cooperation. And uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Wolfer talks about status dilemma, like security dilemma. And that is an interesting topic too. But for a policymaker's perspective, they need to pay attention to this dimension, that like casual statements can really get into thin skin political opponents, no? Like you right, they need to be more sensitive. More and, sensitive. and to questions like protocol and mm -hmm. uh, red carpets and mm -hmm. state and summits inviting the leaders to the dinners or to Congress and give them the respect they think they deserve even if they don't. But the point is, that is where sometimes uh, status slides, as you discuss Mao's uh, uh, extraordinary anger. I, 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 he felt uh, uh, slighted by uh, Stalin. In, in another episode, I remember reading that several days Stalin won't meet him in Moscow visiting first time after the revolution. So these are things that political elite can practice and diplomats can practice because countries like people are sensitive to how others treat them, I guess. So that's something that, uh, something else that we could do research on, more on traditional diplomacy and statecraft and, and how to accord respect. You could interview diplomats and, and look at history. Mm and see whether they themselves felt that and, and what do they do to avoid those situations and how do you uh, give a chance to diplomats from poorer countries for instance and even they probably feel it but they don't express it as much as uh, rich countries diplomats so thank you so much uh, debbie it's a pleasure and uh, 
Hope we can uh, continue our conversation on, on this subject and beyond. And we have a handbook on peaceful change from Oxford University Press is coming, and Debbie is a co-editor. I'm an editor too, so five of us. And that has actually a chapter on status uh, as a source of peaceful change, peaceful status accommodation by Xiao Pu, a very, very smart uh, young scholar from uh, uh, Nevada. Thank you so much, and uh, let's... Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, TV, and thank you for your very informed and interesting questions. Yes, thank you. I'm 